fear is extraordinarily contagious. And we saw that in September of 2008, like we've never seen it before in financial markets. What in the world is happening on Wall Street? If you wait till you know everything, it's too late. Now, most of you wouldn't even know this happened unless you were on the market at the time, but the market fell by almost 50%. And that's, again, this is, it's hard to see because of the log scale hides the depth of a fall in that case, but the market peaked at 1,052 in January of 73, and by December of 94, it's 578. And that's the beginning. Then you have a bubble which takes off in 1982, and that's even greater than the one back in 56. So that's the actual structure of the market. And you end up in 1999 with the market 21 years ahead of its trend. You look at that stuff, and the fit's not so crash hot anymore. But of course, this little bit here, it was good timing. If you're going to put forward a stupid theory of the markets, that was a good time to do it. It's the origins of mainstream finance theory, which are worse than you'd expect. The usual sort of stroke for mainstream economics. The influential contrarian economist, Steve Keen. Brilliant economist that criticizes much of modern economics. The research fellow at the Institute for Strategy, Resilience and Security at University College in London. He is someone that each and every one of us has to listen to, whether we agree or disagree. Here's Steve Keen. Now, the underlying paradigm of neoclassical economics is based upon a subjective theory of value. So you argue value is the satisfaction that the consumer gets from consuming product, and you add value by adding utility. That was the, particularly Jean-Baptiste Say made that very explicit way back in the days when he was arguing at the classical school of thought. But neoclassical is strongly based on a subjective theory of value, and equilibrium plays a major role in their logic, what it's worth, about the cleaving of the equilibrium between supply and demand. And if you think, what does the foundation meme? I think meme is an extremely good way to describe this idea, it was Marshall's drawing of intersecting supply and demand curves determining price. So he first wrote in 1890, I think, revised up to 2020. And he then said to a company, this is rather famous phrase, we might reasonably dispute whether it is the upper or under blade of a pair of scissors that cuts a piece of paper as to whether value is determined by utility or cost of production. So they reached a combined method where marginal cost and marginal revenue both came together to give you price. And both the, the subjective conditions of demand and the objective conditions of production they pull a role in setting both price and quantity. Now, that's the generic model, which they clearly apply to commodity markets, but the finance markets are a different kettle of fish. And the first person to attempt to model this, use, apply this meme to finance was Irving Fisher. And he did it for his PhD thesis, and he was easily the most talented mathematical economist of his time, but he thought it didn't get sufficient reception in 1907. So he republished it in 1930. And I think this means another reason to give Irving Fisher the price for the man with the world's worst timing. So it's called the theory of interest as determined by impatience to spend income and opportunity to invest it. And that alone and the subjective objective elements that I'm talking about a while. Impatience is subjective, opportunity to invest is objective. So the two factors tied together. But there is an important element about both finance markets and labor markets that, of course, neoclassical economists would not mention, or maybe even be conscious of, but of course, I'm going to mention it. And that is the standard model has supply determined by the objective cost of production. So you have marginal cost, you're paying it for inputs at the cost of market price, et cetera. It's all objective stuff. That determines how much you supply. The demand side is subjective. Now, there's enormous problems with these anyway, because marginal cost is assumed to rise. By the, by the textbooks, but when you do empirical research, no, it doesn't. For the vast majority of firms, it falls. It gets worse because for finance, you're not buying and selling on a spot market. The conventional model really applies to spot markets where you, you go down to a fish market or whatever else and you've got to buy the stuff on the day. You buy it, you, pay, you eat it on the day. There's no time element to it. And that's not at all what happens with finance. With finance instead, it's necessarily time dimensioned. You get a loan now, you've got to pay it back over time. You buy a share or a bond, now you get income from it over time. So time is an inevitable part of those markets. You can't just ignore time, as neoclassicals do when they talk about supply and demand for individual commodities on spot markets. So Fisher described finance as being caused by the supply, determined by subjective preferences for individuals for present goods over future goods. So he was aware of this particular dilemma. Demand, the objective possibilities of profitable investment, and then the loanable funds, because fundamentally there's no understanding of money creation in conventional neoclassical theory. And at this stage, Fisher was a conventional theorist. That's the basic system. And he said the rate of interest expresses a price in the exchange between present and future goods. So time is tied up there again, which he's acknowledging. So how do you handle time? Well, it's simple. You make assumptions. And here are the two assumptions that Fisher made to handle the time dimension of finance. 
the market must be cleared in respect to every interval of time. So rather than just saying there's a spot market, which in equilibrium, you push it through time, it's got to be in equilibrium through the whole of time. And secondly, debts must be repaid. This is 1930. And of course, by 1929, he was already suffering very badly personally from the fact that these two assumptions were violently contradicted by the real world. And in response to that, and this is why I have a lot of time for Irving Fisher as a person as well as an economist, he had the courage to change his mind. It also was the sheer shock of being sent bankrupt, destroyed, totally wrong in your predictions. There was an enormous existential experience for him, but he came through with it with an alternative theory. And an essential component of that was abandoning equilibrium, did it very explicitly. And I'll talk a bit more of that when I explain Minsky's financial instability hypothesis, one which I'm covering later in these lectures on finance. Now, typically, the neoclassicals ignored his work on debt deflation, and they rebuilt his equilibrium analysis after the Great Depression was over and after the Second World War. And the foundation paper of the modern, no, no, I hate to call it modern, but the conventional theory of finance, the capital asset pricing model, was given by Sharp in a paper published in 1964. And notice it says, the theory of market equilibrium under conditions of risk. So the market reaching equilibrium and risk rather than uncertainty determining the volatility of shares. So he started off by saying, there's one of the problems that's plagued those attempting to predict the behavior of capital markets is the absence of a body of positive pro-economic theory dealing with conditions of risk. So forget about macro. This is all being done from the level of microeconomics. And he developed a model of asset allocation under conditions of risk. So he started, if you think about the neoclassical theory of consumption, the subjective side of the theory, you have a consumer who's maximizing utility subject to income constraints. And that became, in Sharp's hand, he made that an investor maximizing utility subject to return and risk. Now, the utility is therefore seen as a positive function of expected return. So the more of a return you expect to get from a particular share, the higher your utility, but a negative function of risk, which was treated as standard deviation. So the risk is the standard deviation, the variation of returns over time for a particular share. And the constraints that that's a utility. What are your constraints on your utility? It's the available spectrum of opportunities for investment. And when you look at the consumer theory, the budget line is the constraint, and that's a product of your income and relative prices, and also your subjective preferences. But here, rather than have the consumer budget line, you have what you call the investment opportunity curve, or IOC. Now, all investments were ranked by Sharp on two dimensions, expected return and standard deviation the expected return of each share. So you, you have expected annual return, which is a good, expected volatility of bad. And therefore, when you put each share somewhere that you're on a chart showing volatility vertically and return horizontally, each of those dots on this chart will be of an investment, a particular share you can invest in. And then he combines that with the idea of indifference curves between return and risk for individual consumers. So here's the utility maximization problem as shown in the article. Here are the utility curves, and this is the opportunities and you therefore try to maximize your outcome. So the return going further to the right is a good thing. Volatility is bad, so the lower you are on the vertical axis, the better. So therefore, the direction of utility increasing is to the bottom right-hand corner of the graph rather than going up to the top right-hand corner, which is for standard commodities. This one points down. Now, every dot here is an individual share. Obviously, just a diagram, but if you did it yourself, you'd have a cloud of different combinations and each one would be IBM or Tesla or whatever else. Now, every dot on the edge is a share portfolio. And this is about one of the slightly clever things in the paper, because he argues that if you have an individual share with expected return and a volatility, a standard deviation, and another share with a different expected return and a different volatility, when you combine the expected returns, it's just the linear sum of the two. But when you combine the standard deviations, it involves the correlations and the ratio of the standard deviations as well. So if you have diversification, you reduce the risk element unless the shares are perfectly correlated. So they're not perfectly correlated, you can't reduce risk by combining them. But if they're not perfectly correlated, you reduce the risk by diversification. Therefore, all these points on the curve here are not an individual share, they're a portfolio of shares. And that's what he called the investment opportunity curve, this arc from A to X up here. So for this particular investor, just the way the drawing is, is, is made, that's the optimal combination. The investor should buy portfolio F. Now, when you have borrowing, and that basically means you can buy government bonds, which have a risk-free rate of return, then you can combine that bond with a pure asset, which returns P, which is the pure interest rate. You can combine that with any of the portfolios you like, but you therefore locate yourself not on the cloud, and not on the point, but on a tangent. So the point of tangency now is the ideal location for that investor if they simply bought shares, but they can either 
have a portfolio consisting entirely of bonds, or they can have a levered portfolio of the share market. They borrow and buy more shares than they get, and they therefore lever up this return further out that way. So what the investor will do now is choose some point along this line, which is the capital market line, or it becomes the capital market line. So if you borrow money at the risk-free rate, you can buy more shares than you have money for, margin debt and things like that. So here's now showing the situation. And you have three investors here. You have investor A, who is uh, conservative. And they, if they could only buy what's on the market, they'd be on G. But because they can combine their risk-free, purchasing risk-free asset with some levered just in the stock market, they're going to be in this line instead. B is a more normal person. This one is a thrill seeker. And the thing for all of them, this is the optimal combination to buy. Now, problem here, first of all, this thing is subjective as well. Okay, but they're supposed to be objective at the same time. So you think each of us can have a different idea of where you place IBM or Tesla or you know, Maserati, whatever else on this diagram. So the expectations about the prospects of different shares and they're held by different individuals. So there could be a different cloud and different lines for every investor, unless you make an assumption. We assume homogeneity of investor expectations. Investors are assumed to agree on the prospects of various investments, the expected values, standard deviations, and correlation coefficients. What the fuck? Honestly, this is just obviously a crazy false assumption. That is simply not true. We know people take bull and bear positions in the market. You'll have stop par dinner parties where you argue over the value of shares. Some people think Tesla's worth a fortune. Others would like to incarcerate the owner. You know, there's, as they said, that's all abolished. None of that happens. We all agree. You can't have a conversation about, about the share market because you all agree with everything. Now, needless follows directly on from coefficients. There's no, no break between the two. He said, needless to say, these are highly restrictive and undoubtedly unrealistic assumptions. So how does he justify it? He pulls out a, a bastardized version of Milton Friedman's as if methodology, which I'll discuss in the future lectures on methodology, which says, however, since the proper test of a theory is not the realism of its assumptions, but the acceptability of its implications, vague waffle, and since these assumptions apply equilibrium conditions, which form a major part of classical financial doctrine, it's far from clear that we should reject this, especially since there seems to be no other theory out there. So it was not exactly a, a ringing endorsement, but he said, let's make this crazy assumption and then see what we get. So the crazy assumption means that everybody agrees on the cloud. So everybody buys the same portfolio. And that makes that portfolio more expensive, which reduces its return. And equally, the people who don't buy other shares, the, the price falls. So you get a jiggling of prices. And what actually happens is finally a whole range of portfolios align with the capital market line. So you can choose portfolio A or B, C or B and get the same rate of return because of the market process. So there's a whole range of portfolios now that'll give you the tangent to the market line. And that's where the capital market line comes from. That's this particular part of the theory. And what he says, in equilibrium, there'll be a simple linear relationship between expected return and standard deviation. That's where the idea came from. Higher return, a higher risk necessarily because of a bunch of crazy assumptions about how stock markets actually behave. So this is where the idea that you have a benign view of stock markets, there's a risk return trade-off. If you want a higher return, you've got to put up with higher risk, but it's all quite simple and rational and in equilibrium. Half some algebra, which I won't bother taking you through. He then said, if you take an individual share, share I, then you can say the return on share I is equal to the pure rate of interest plus the correlation that I has with other assets in its class. So it's a you know, correlation coefficient between plus one and minus one multiply by the ratio of the standard deviations times the gap between the asset classes return and the pure rate of interest. And that became known as beta. That particular combination of factors multiplied together became a stock's beta, which showed its relative performance compared to the broader market. So this is the equation. And this bit here is beta. That's the one that people spend all their time trying to calculate. So you get a higher return. If your asset is highly correlated to the stock market, you're going to get a higher rate of return, but necessarily it gives you a high level of as well. And the expected return of of the asset R is risk peculiar to that particular asset within this portfolio. So it's going to be distributed around the overall line for the portfolio itself. And that's beta. That's where you'll see pages of stock market journals reporting beta. That's how they calculate it. They work out a correlation coefficient, standard deviation, work out the ratio, and they publish that as a beta. And that became, you know, the basis of conventional approaches to the stock market for, you know, the last 50 or 60 years. Now, the funny thing is, initially, when this crazy theory first came out, Eugene Thammer was the person who decided, here's I'm going to make my career. I'm going to empirically verify the capital asset pricing market. And he went through the data and found a fairly good fit. This is in 1970 now. So this is the evolution from 58 to 70 of the conventional view of finance. And in a later paper, they summarized the three 
empirical tests. One is that expected returns are linearly related to their betas and nothing else has any real explanatory power. The second is the premium is positive. So the more risk you take on, the more return you get. And the third, that if you have assets which are uncorrelated with the market, they're going to return their pure rate of interest. The beta premium is the expected market return minus the risk-free rate, all the stuff I've shown you in those formulas beforehand. So that's the foundations of the capital asset pricing model. Now, using data from 1946 to 1966, and those dates are extremely important. FAMA found a very good fit for the for the model, but it's crazy. There's obviously something totally wrong with it. So why did he get that fit? So here he's going through making his case. The efficient market hypothesis, hypothesis stands up well. The results depend to some extent upon the validity of its assumptions, but you know, let's check the data and see how well it does. And well, he said, it seems to be not just a good first approximation, but a good second approximation for most investors. And this is one reason why it swept the market at the time. So there's plenty of evidence to support it. There's very, very little evidence to contradict it. Now, he did admit one curious fact, and this will turn up when I start talking about the fractal markets hypothesis in a couple of lectures times. He said, one departure from a pure random walk is that if there's large daily price movement in one direction, it's followed by large daily price movements it's again. But the, the interesting thing is the sign of the next movement is apparently random. So if a big step in the market, the next step is a big one. But that contradicts the random walk hypothesis because the random walk, each time the drunk takes a step, it's random step, random direction and a random magnitude. There should be no relationship from one step to another. He found there was. If there's a big upward movement, there'd be a big upward or downward movement the next day. Large scale goes with large scale, small scale goes with small scale. But he basically said, oh, that does, that's only a little curly. You know, one cancels out the other. So overall, we can accept the overall outcome. Now, as I said, the assumptions are ludicrous. So why the hell did he find a good fit? What's going on to explain that? This is the one I gave to my students back at the end of the 90s, but the data is still quite accurate. I've got the Dow Jones Industrial Act average from 1915 to 1999. And when you do an exponential plot to that and then put that plot on a logarithmic chart, you get a straight line, of course. And you look at the index versus the straight line, and it's either well above or well below that line, except for 1955 to 1973. So here's the data. You can see the 1929 stock market crash there. Okay. That's the 87 stock market crash in terms of scale. And, you know, the, the way above, way below, way below, flat, close to it, dead flat, and then taking off once more. So here's the period between 49 and 66. It's above the exponential rate, but it's growing fairly smoothly. So if you do linear regression, then you're going to find, yep, okay, there's a relationship between risk and return. Sharpe's paper was published in 1970. So it's just at the point where the market starts to go horizontal, but for the previous data, the fit looks pretty good. Then you have a crash of 1973. Now, most of you wouldn't even know this happened unless you were on the market at the time, but the market fell by almost 50%. And that's, again, this is, it's hard to see because of the log scale hides the depth of a fall in that case, but the market peaked at 1,052 in January of 73. And by December of 94, it's 578. And that's the beginning. I use that as the indicator where we flip from semi-Keynesian to, to monetarist views in the economy because a whole range of things came along that, that seemed to contradict uh, the Keynesian thing, including, of course, stagflation. He said the real way to make money is to, to, to exploit the fact the market is inefficient, highly inefficient, and you can make money by take, buying low, high return, low risk shares and watching their price rise as the market catches up to you. If you're like many other truth seekers and want to learn 50 years of real economics, from me in only seven weeks, you'll love my new seven-week Rebel Economist Challenge as well. To apply, go to apply.stevecanfree.com. If you qualify, you can attend my lectures, ask me questions personally every week, and make friends with a great group of like-minded people. So again, like many others, go to apply.stevecanfree.com to apply as well for the seven-week Rebel Economist Challenge. Good luck.